In the modern mind, the birth of the Roman Republic is often framed and imagined as a restoration of freedom to a Roman population oppressed by monarchy. And in some ways, this is true, at least for a certain part of the Roman population. But if we think about what the later monarchy looked like in Rome, and we think about the structures that the later kings, especially Servius Tullius, put in place, what we begin to see is that the challenge in the Republic is a little bit different from what we imagine. Because the Republic is not a challenge to a regime based on unfreedom. It's instead a counter-revolution led by aristocrats against a regime that had depositioned aristocrats from a dominant position in Roman state and instead placed a coalition of soldiers and common people allied around a Roman king in the position of dominance in the Roman state. And so what we have to imagine is that the Republic is actually an aristocratic counter-revolution against what would be called by aristocrats the tyranny of Servius Tullius and Tarquinius Superbus. And basically what we have to understand is because it's a counter-revolution, it's a reaction. Um, and it's a very reactionary structure. And the way that the Republic is created is designed to be a reactionary structure that coalesces power around an aristocratic oligarchy dominated by patricians. And so political power in Rome following the establishment of the Republic becomes something like, say, closed membership in a golf club, uh, a very traditional, say, a very traditional golf club in which patricians dominate. And it's very, very hard for people who are not patricians to break into the club and to have their voice heard in political affairs in Rome. And this was something that was actually, of course, quite distinct from what we saw under the kings. Because under the kings, and especially under the last two kings, ultimate political power rested with the king, but the king worked closely with the Comitia Centuriata, this, this assembly that Servius Tullius had created that was based on uh, allocating votes to the people who served most prominently and importantly in the Roman army. Of course, these were the members of the hoplite phalanx. And the Comitia Centuriata was organized in such a way that the phalanx soldiers voted on things like whether the state should go to war, whether it should make peace, uh, and other aspects of policy that directly affected them. And so what Servius Tullius had created was, in effect, a government dominated by one individual whose conduct and activities were checked by the regular consultation with the soldiers who backed the regime and uh, would do most of the fighting that he would ask them to undertake. Now, uh, the question that is pretty legitimately able to be raised is, why did the hoplite phalanx soldiers go along with this aristocratic counter-revolution that deposed their champion uh, and put them in a position where they were no longer the leading voice in the state? And there's a couple of answers to this. I mean, the first answer is that Servius Tullius had worked very closely with that assembly and had worked in a way like a constitutional monarch. Uh, where he believed that consultation was essential, and he tried to build out a regime that included lots of different voices. But when we look at the, per the portrayal of the regime of, Sir of Tarquinius Superbus, what we see is our sources tell us Tar Tarquin kind of coalesced power around family members. And so it could well be that members of the hoplite phalanx sort of withheld judgment about what the Republic would look like because they weren't particularly happy with the way Tarquin had been running things. They also felt somewhat marginalized from his structures. Uh, but it's also, I think, important to understand that a revolution is something that is complicated. Its outcome is complicated. What it's going to mean for people is undecided, and it's in some ways indecipherable. And so the question really to raise is, what would prompt those people to either support the aristocracy, and these people meaning the hoplite phalanx, what would prompt them to support the aristocracy in creating a Republican structure designed around privileging the aristocrats, or what would prompt them to resist this? And if we can't see a strong motivation on either side, either to support this aggressively or to resist it aggressively, I think what we can imagine is that the leaders and the soldiers in the hoplite phalanx basically are waiting to see what the Republic is going to look like. 
And our sources give us a sense that this is exactly what's going on. Uh, the members of the phalanx, the soldiers, um, probably expected that with the king gone, the centuriate assembly would basically become the most important assembly in the Roman state. And this meant that the aristocrats who overthrew the monarchy, uh, as consuls, they, of course, are voted on by the Centurion Assembly. And so you have a model that is something like a regular circulation of supreme leadership in the Roman state that is still accountable to and checked by votes in an assembly. And that assembly is dominated by the phalanx. And so we could imagine why they might think this could work, why soldiers in the phalanx might think that this could work. Um, but it becomes very clear that the new offices that are created are not designed to be open offices. They are instead offices that are supposed to be held by patricians. And while the Comitia Centuriata could vote on consuls, most of the people in the Comitia Centuriata were never going to be eligible to serve as consul. And this, over time, became very uh, troubling to the plebeians, the non-patricians, uh, the people who could vote on the consulship, but actually couldn't hold the office. Uh, and we see in descriptions of what happens afterwards, we see that there are initial support, there is initial support among plebeians for the, for the uh, overthrow of the monarchy, but we also see that they begin to realize that the structure put in place by the Republic is not actually about liberty for everyone. It is not this structure where patricians will cooperate with the Comitia Centuriata, and in a sense, operate in such a way where the uh, monarchy is simply replaced by elected consuls that work closely with the Comitia Centuriata. Instead, what happens is the patricians create a structure that is designed to be dominated by patricians and to serve the interests of patricians. And the plebeians in the Comitia Centuriata and also in other aspects of Roman life are removed from that. They don't have a say. And so in a sense, uh, the monarchy of Tarquinius Superbus is replaced by an oligarchy, but the plebeians still do not have an adequate say in what's going on. So when we see in our historians, and especially in Livy, a discussion of this, what Livy says is after Tarquin died uh, in 494 BC, the patricians and the plebeians both rejoiced at the news, but the plebeians, to whom the patricians had diligently attended up until that time, now began to be harmed by their superiors. And Livy goes on to say, large number of plebeians were grumbling that although they fought abroad for freedom, liberty, libertas, um, and, dom and dominion, at home they were oppressed and enslaved by their fellow citizens. So this, I think, points to a key moment in the transition in the Roman Republic. Because the Roman Republic, when it's fighting for its survival against Tarquin, first when Tarquin and Lars Porsena uh, attack the city of Rome and try to get Tarquin restored, and then when the Latin allies cooperate with Tarquin and try to get Tarquin restored. Um, up until that point, and even through the Battle of Lake Regulus, when Tarquin is working alongside Latin allies to try to, to bring about his restoration as king of Rome, Romans can come together, and the patricians understand that they need plebeian support to win military victories against Tarquin and his supporters. But after the Battle of Lake Regulus, and after Tarquin's death in 495 BC, this breaks down. The necessity of patricians cultivating good relationships with plebeians breaks down because the threat of a restoration of the monarchy has disappeared. And so what Livy says is the minute that that threat of a restored monarchy goes away, patricians and plebeians are both excited about this. But almost immediately after that, patricians then drop the boom on plebeians. And what they say in essence is, okay, well, now that the monarchy is gone, this is now our state. And plebeians, thank you for helping us, but we are going to do our own thing. And if you don't like it, too bad for you. And so with Tarquin's death, it has now become impossible for, ple for plebeians to leverage the possibility of the restoration of the monarchy against patricians. It's become impossible for plebeians to say that our rights must be protected against patricians uh, because otherwise we will support the monarch coming back. 
And without that leverage, patricians simply start ignoring the needs of plebeians. They start, as Livy says, um, oppressing and enslaving their fellow citizens. And so plebeians now have to either accept this situation and live with it, or do something about it. And as you can imagine, this is not a situation that could endure. Uh, and so in 494 BC, excluded peoples begin a long process to make the government more inclusive. And these excluded peoples are, of course, plebeians pushing back against a patrician-dominated Roman Republic. So in 494 BC, in response to this growing oppression um, and enslavement, and what Livy says, um, about enslavement is a little bit dubious because Livy is talking about patricians enslaving plebeians through debts. Um, it's not clear that that's exactly what's happening, but oppression is certainly going on. Um, and in 494 BC, plebeians leave the city and they form an alternative government on the Aventine Hill. So what we see here is our, again, our map of the city of Rome. Um, this is a map of the city of Rome in the 8th century BC, but by the the time we're talking about, 494 BC, uh, what we have to understand is the city of Rome basically encompasses the Capitoline, the Palatine, so the Capodoglio, the Palatino, and the, and the Calio, um, and then also elements of the Esquiline. Uh, and the Aventine is across what will become the Circus Maximus uh, and the Forum Boarium. Uh, and this is a place that has a temple to the goddess Ceres on it. And so in 494 BC, the plebeians leave the city of Rome. They go across what will be the Circus Maximus. Uh, and there they, they, can, they camp out on the Aventine Hill and hijack a temple of Ceres. And they call this temple of Ceres the sort of uh, the centerpiece of what will become a plebeian parallel structure, a parallel government structure, where the plebeians will uh, basically create their own offices and assemblies that counteract the patrician-dominated offices and assemblies that the early republic has structured. This is called the secession of the plebeians. Now, it might seem like the secession of the plebeians is a major step. We can imagine, and some historiography has talked about, some historians have talked about this, kind of like the Russian Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and a lot of scholars have seen in this an economic cause. And Livy gives us a little bit of grounds for that when he talks about this idea of debts uh, leading to the enslavement of, of plebeians by patricians. <clears throat> but the economic cause, the, the seeing of the challenge between patricians and plebeians as something grounded in class struggle ignores the difference between patricians and plebeians. Um, because the plebeian order is not an economic structure. It's a structure basically of uh, determined by birth. And so the patricians are an aristocracy. They are wealthy, but all of the wealthy people in Rome are not patricians. There are wealthy and important plebeians as well. And so if there are wealthy and ple important plebeians, uh, they are likely to be the people leading this revolt. People who are enslaved do not usually have the freedom uh, and the autonomy to lead a revolution. They also don't have the social capital to get a lot of people together to agree to, to remove themselves to the Aventine Hill. Um, what we see in our sources instead is the people doing this are soldiers, which is what we would expect, right? Because the hoplite phalanx are the people who are most displaced uh, by the overthrow of the monarchy, and other plebeian leaders of some importance. And so these aren't indebted slaves revolting against an oppressive structure. Uh, this is not a class struggle. This is instead a conflict of the orders, the patrician order versus the plebeian order. And orders are based not on economic status, but on birth. And so wealthy and important plebeians are leading the secession of the plebs. Um, and this, of course, makes a lot of sense because wealthy and important and well-connected figures are able to organize mass movements in ways that poor people working um, lots of different jobs and scrambling to make ends meet uh, or enslaved people are not capable of doing. And the secession of the plebs then is about power. It's not about money. 
And so indebted slaves would support this for sure. When they feel that the republic is a structure that is not supporting their interests and is causing them economic and, and personal problems, they will support a revolution that's designed to change the balance of power in that state. But they're not going to organize it because they don't have the capacity to organize it. Um, the other thing that's important is poor people who rebel are in a way replaceable. Influential and important people who rebel are not. And so the secession of the plebs matters because it is led by important people, specifically soldiers, that the army um, and the Roman state cannot function without. And so the secession of the plebs, which in essence means all plebeians or most plebeians or whatever plebeians can be organized to do this, leave the city of Rome, cross the Circus Maximus and go to the Aventine, is a problem because the city of Rome cannot afford to have plebeians not serving in the military and not cooperating economically with the state. And so they, the, the plebeians have found a new way to exercise leverage and to, to catalyze a negotiation with the leaders of the republic. Uh, with the king gone, they need a new way to make themselves, make the essential status uh, that they have in the Roman state clear to patricians who are denying them the political authority and the power that they feel they deserve. And so when the secession of the plebs happens, um, there are a few consequences to this. The most important consequence is that eventually the patricians realize that this, is a, this situation is unsustainable. What they cannot do is continue to have a government that is totally patrician dominated because the state will not function. Plebeians will not allow this to continue going on. And so relatively quickly, an agreement is reached on the following terms. The plebeians should have their own magistrates, who would be sacrosanct. And these officials should have the right to give help to plebeians in actions against the patrician consuls, uh, but no senator, and by this they mean patrician, um, the Latin is actually patres, uh, no patrician can hold this office. This is only for plebeians. And so two tribunes of the plebs were elected, and they chose three others to be their colleagues. Now this structure is something that is quite important um, because the another aspect of this is in addition to the tribune of the plebs, plebeians will also have their own assembly and it's an assembly that patricians cannot attend. So the Comitia Centuriata had both plebeians and patrician voters. Uh, the, the assembly of the plebeians of course only has plebeians. In addition, because patricians dominate the consulship, plebeians now create their own version of the consulship. Uh, this is the tribune of the plebs. And one aspect of the uh, tribune, the tribunate, is that holders of this, the tribunes, are sacrosanct. Uh, and the tribunes claim this right because they possess the Temple of Ceres on the Aventine. And so because of that, they can call down a curse on any patrician who breaks the idea of sacrosanctity. Now, to us, this can seem ridiculous. Um, you have, you know, a random temple, and therefore you've created this own rationale that you can protect yourself by calling down curses on people because you, you possess a temple. Um, it's a very strange idea. But in reality, the sacrosanctity of a tribune is not challenged for over 300 years. Um, and originally, this is a religious thing, but in 449 BC, it was confirmed legally by the Valerio Horatian Law. And so the sacrosanctity is something that Tribunes can claim both because of the temple and also because of like legal status as of 490 or 449 BC. Um, the other thing that the patrician uh, that the plebeians can do against patricians is they can literally use their sacred sanctity to step between a plebeian and a patrician who is mistreating them. And so the sacred sanctity is literally designed to be a kind of protective power that tribunes can use to make sure that plebeians are not being oppressed by patricians. This might seem a little bit abstract, um, but the other thing that the, that the tribunes of the plebs have uh, is not as abstract. Basically, the structure created by the first secession of the plebs is something that ultimately will be integrated into the Roman state, but initially it's not. 
what they have effectively done is created a separate plebeian republic, a separate plebeian government structure. And it is something that has deliberate conflicts with the structure that the patricians have created. Because the tribunes of the plebs can pass legislation. They can introduce laws. Uh, they can block patricians from acting against plebeians. And so the tribunes of the plebs represent alternative consuls in a sort of alternative plebeian constitutional structure. The plebeian assembly represents an alternative structure, an alternative voting structure to the more integrated assembly uh, that you have in the patrician dominated state. Uh, but all of these plebeian structures are open only to plebeians. But the plebeian leadership claims that their actions are binding on all Romans. Even the patricians who cannot attend the assembly, cannot even speak before the assembly in most contexts, and cannot run for the tribune at, at all. In practice, though, these two parallel constitutional structures, a plebeian constitutional structure and a patrician constitutional structure, oftentimes work very well together. Because what the plebeian tribunes do, and what they understand their job to be, is to basically col uh, collaborate with the consuls to be sure that the concerns of plebeians are spoken about to the consuls, and to ensure that the consuls and the tribunes work together as a liaison, to be sure that the interests of both patricians and plebeians are explained to the others, and these two parallel constitutional structures work more or less together. <clears throat> and so what this means is most of the time, these structures do not conflict with each other. And so when the Concilium Plebis, this is the, the assembly of the plebeians, comes together, uh, tribunes propose legislation before this, but they also have veto power against what another tribune has put forward. And generally speaking, it's understood that if a tribune is going to put something forward, uh, it will have been communicated with the uh, patrician leadership, uh, and it will generally have been something that's vetted by that leadership. And if a tribune tries to go beyond this, other tribunes may step in and exercise veto power to prevent that legislation from going forward. But ultimately, if push comes to shove, if plebeians are sufficiently angry and there is no veto being exercised by any tribune of the plebs, the assembly can pass laws that it claims are binding on all Romans, even though patricians don't participate in that assembly. And these laws are called plebiscites, or plebiscitum in Latin. Um, and for years, there are constitutional arguments about who plebiscites affected, but most of the time, because there is this process of negotiation, patricians will not acknowledge the principle that a plebiscite is binding on them, but they will basically observe the rules that are followed. Um, it takes a long time, though, before these institutions created in the first secession of the plebeians are fully integrated into one unified Roman government structure. And this process, this 200-year process, is something that's called the conflict of the orders, because it's a process in which the claims that the plebeians make to create this entirely separate plebeian structure to government ultimately um, fold into a constitutional structure where the parallel patrician and plebeian governments merge. Um, and this process takes a good four, it takes a good 200 years and there are another four secession of the plebs uh, between, 280, between 484 and 287 when the process conclu concludes. And we're not going to walk through the entire process um, because in some ways it's a, a very deep and inside baseball kind of approach to Roman politics, but there are some high points. Um, so in 445 BC, there's a, a secession of the plebs uh, and that ultimately leads to the, uh, a law that overturns a prohibition of marriage between patrician and plebeians. In 367, we have a big shift. Uh, in 367 BC, the Licinio Sextian laws are passed. And this is the moment when um, the true separation of patrician and plebeian government structures begins to really break down. 
Uh, because the 367 passage of the Licinio Sextian laws is a victory for basically integration of these two structures. Licinius and Sextus had been elected tribunes in 376 BC, so nine years before these laws are put in place. And their goal was to open the consulship to plebeians. Um, and their thinking was if the consulship is open to plebeians, the parallel structure where plebeians can only be tribunes and patricians consuls breaks down. Because now if plebeians can be consuls, this collaborative structure where patrician consuls uh, work with plebeian tribunes begins to uh, merge in such a way that plebeian tribunes can work with patrician consuls, but they also can become consuls themselves. Uh, and so they proposed these laws in 376, um, and they put them together in a, a kind of legislative package that includes other things like forgiveness of debts and land redistributions to try to build popularity for this idea of opening the consulship to plebeians. Um, and there's a long, long time where the law, the collection of laws keeps getting vetoed. Um, ultimately, though, they remain in place. The government remains in place for nine years. They block elections, they block measures to try to turn over the government. I mean, nothing is done for nine years until finally in 367, patricians relent and they allow the motion to go through and plebeians then have access to the consulship. Uh, then in 342, a law is passed that says not only are plebeians able to access the consulship, but uh, one of the consulships must always be held by a plebeian. And then the last phase in this process is the Lex Hortensia issued in 287 that says that for the first time, all plebiscites will bind patricians. And so what we see in the conflict of the orders is a general process through which the working understanding uh, that enabled Rome most of the time to negotiate having two distinctive constitutional structures, one patrician and one plebeian, um, begins to get formalized. And it gets formalized in a process through which plebeians begin to get the right to serve in patrician offices. And then as the patrician side of the Roman constitution uh, becomes more diverse and includes more plebeians, the situation of separation between plebeian and patrician offices and structures completely breaks down. Uh, and by 287 BC, you have an integrated structure where the Roman constitution has uh, tribunes of the plebs. By that point, there are 10 of them. Consuls, some of which are patricians, some of which are plebeians. Uh, a senate and a administrative structure that includes both patricians and plebeians. And a concilium plebis that works alongside the interests of the patricians to be sure that the interests of the tribunes, uh, the consuls, the senate, the patricians and the plebeians are all respected in the discussions in that legislative body. And so this is a history of events um, and the history of events can move pretty quickly. But what we need to understand is that this is a process. This is a process that leads to effective integration of uh, an interaction between patricians and plebeians. And what we also have to see is this is a process that unfolds peacefully. And so the conflict of the orders is not a civil war. The conflict of the orders is not a war at all. It's a conflict, but it's a political conflict. And it shows the strength of the Roman Republic that this political conflict is decided politically, not violently. It's decided through compromise. It's decided through consensus building. And when there actually is a breakdown in an ability to reach a consensus, plebeians don't rebel they leave the city. They leave the city so that they can exercise leverage and convince patricians to make a deal. And the secession of the plebs are dramatic events, but they clearly represent times when political tensions have gone beyond a breaking point, but they also are actions led by people who are deeply invested in the structures of the Roman Republic. They're led by rich, influential plebeians who want to reform the state, not revolutionize the state. Um, revolutions have winners and losers. 
And these people are, in every aspect except for the way that they exercise political power, they are already winners in the Republic. The wealthy plebeians, the important plebeians who lead the secessions of the plebs, are people who want this conflict to be resolved peacefully because they are wealthy and important people who will lose something if there is violence. Uh, and so this is an important aspect to understand about the Roman state. It is for a very long time able to peacefully resolve its political conflicts without civil war, um, without significant violence. Uh, everybody in this state understands the value of peaceful political compromise and consensus building. So um, these changes then occur over 200 years. They're slow moving. They're evolutionary. Uh, and as they occur, basically what we see is these, it's a long process of negotiation, but it is negotiation. So the struggle of the orders um, and the conflict of the orders did a great deal to define Roman society and Roman political life in the period between 494 and 287 BC. But what is this society actually like? What is this Roman world that's evolving in this new way and, and is undergoing these political challenges? Well, for some of this period, it's very, very hard to say, especially when we're looking in the fifth century. Um, we just have very little in the way of primary source documents and even primary sources at all uh, that point to what Roman life is like. But we do have a very significant uh, document that allows us to see some of what the concerns in Roman life actually were like. What was this society actually like in the middle part of the fifth century BC? Uh, and the document that we can turn our attention to to see this is something that's called the Twelve Tables. Now, as a document, the Twelve Tables is, is a bit problematic because it's fragmentary now. We don't actually have the Twelve Tables. We don't actually have, you know, uh, tables that we can look at or uh, objects that we can look at that say, hey, these are the Twelve Tables and this is what's on them. What we have instead are fragmentary references to things in the Twelve Tables in later uh, sources. But we do have a lot of um, stories that are told about how the Twelve Tables come about. And so to understand its creation, what we need to do is, is look at some of the literary sources that we have uh, that are of some dubious reliability. Um, but basically, the story that we're told is that the Twelve Tables comes out of some of the tensions within the conflict of the orders in the middle part of the 5th century. And the uh, reason most of our sources say the Twelve Tables was composed is because of pressure to compose a written law code. Uh, and this makes some sense. At a certain stage of political sophistication, every society needs to have this happen. They need to have a written code of laws so that everybody kind of knows the rules of the game uh, that they're operating under. And in the past, the uh, implementation of law was determined by officials, patrician officials called praetors. And without written law, plebeians were rightly skeptical of the impartiality and even sometimes the uh, motivations of what these praetors were doing. And so agitation for written code of law begins apparently in around 462 BC, and it's set by 454 BC, an embassy is sent to Greece to look at the Athenian legal system. And the Roman ambassadors, the story goes, are they go to Athens, uh, and they ask to look at the law codes of Solon, and then in 451 BC, they agree that a codification of law should be undertaken. And then something interesting happens. Um, something that our narrative says is a temporary suspension of the Roman constitution and all constitutional offices for a year. The consuls and the tribunes of the plebs all step down and a board of 10 men called the Decemvirs is chosen. And they're given responsibility for governing while also drafting a code of laws. Now, uh, this is an interesting claim that I think reflects the fact that the Decemvirate only lasts for two years and is overthrown because it becomes tyrannical. But it's, I think, a lot more interesting uh, to look at a reconstruction that some scholars have proposed that says, in essence, the Decemvirate and the creation of this board of 10 men to make laws is actually intended to be a kind of permanent constitutional structure. Um, a constitutional structure that gets around to this idea that in 451 BC, you have these parallel patrician and plebeian structures that uh, conflict with each other potentially. Um, and so the consuls step down and the tribunes of the plebs step down. In essence, the leadership of the patrician side of the Roman government 
and the plebeian side of the Roman government both stepped down and they're replaced by a body of 10 men. Um, the first group, it seems, are all patricians, although one of them, a man named Ganicius, has a plebeian name. And so it's possible that what we have here is a, a person who represents a kind of bridge between patrician and plebeian, um, who may well belong to one of those few families that found itself elevated from plebeian to patrician ranks. Uh, and then this group, when they take power, they spend the year issuing laws, uh, laws that structure Roman society and also governing the Roman state. This sounds in some ways like it could be a permanent constitutional structure or the beginning of a permanent constitutional structure. Um, but then at the end of this, the, at the end of their year, the uh, first board of 10 men steps down and a new board is chosen. And uh, the first group formed uh, laws or issued laws that filled 10 inscribed bronze tablets, and then they step down, and the second board of 10 takes office. And this is a board in 450 BC that includes several plebeians. So again, this suggests that maybe what we do have here is an experiment in government to try to bring together the patrician and plebeian structures by creating something new that is both patrician and plebeian. Now, the second group of Decemvirs in 450 BC issues another two tablets. But at the end of the year, what we're told is they refuse to step down. And our sources tell us that members of the board then began behaving tyrannically. And the worst example involved a man named Appius Claudius. So Appius Claudius is said to have been the leader of this second group of Decemvirs. And he's also actually the only one who was uh, chosen for a second term. because He was also in the first group of Decemvirs. Um, now, Appius Claudius is a patrician. He belongs to that family of Claudii that entered Rome with an army and negotiated kind of their, their advancement to patrician status on that basis. Now, the story goes that um, in 450, he begins to lust after a girl named Virginia. And uh, he claims that Virginia was actually um, someone who was uh, enslaved uh, and should have been, you know, his possession. Uh, and he sends some supporters to seize the girl. And Virginia, Virginia and her father and people allied with her, um, they make the claim that she's actually not a slave, that she's actually a free person, that she shouldn't be subject to this. Uh, but when he sends supporters to seize Virginia, Virginia's father kills her to save her the dishonor of being raped by Appius Claudius. So you see on the left of this woodcut, and this is a much this is a medieval woodcut. It's not in any way contemporaneous with the events. Uh, what we see is Virginia's father stabbing her in the heart. Um, very similar, of course, to what happened with Lucretia. Uh, and then um, Appius Claudius is, you know, uh, subject to extreme popular outcry. Uh, and so the popular outcry against Appius Claudius because of what was done with Virginia leads to the a secession of the plebeians and the collapse of the decemvirate. And so this secession of the plebs forces the decemvirs to step down and the Roman state then restores its old constitution, but it keeps the 12 tables. It keeps the laws adapted and issued by the decemvirs. So I think there's some good reason to be suspicious of this narrative, right? Virginia, the name sounds a whole lot like virginity. Uh, it seems a whole lot like the evil um, Appius Claudius is spoiling the purity of the Roman state in a kind of metaphorical way by also spoiling the life of Virginia. Um, there's a lot of problems with this historical narrative. But I think that what we can imagine is that Romans quickly believe and quickly understand that they're not comfortable with the decemvirate. They're not comfortable with a structure like they had. And the constitutional experiment of combining patrician and plebeian structures of government didn't work. And so the secession of the plebs is, in essence, a move to bring back the old structure of the Roman constitution, get rid of the decemvirate and go back to this parallel patrician and plebeian structure that will then last um, until eventually it's dismantled through the reforms of the fourth and um, early third centuries. So this incident is an interesting kind of side note in a longer progression of constitutional developments that takes 200 years. 
but it's a side note that produces a document that is really important. Because despite the problematic historical narrative of why the Twelve Tables were created, the Twelve Tables actually do represent a legitimate document that reveals a great deal about Roman society at the time it was composed. Um, and Romans understood this. Romans saw the Twelve Tables as an important historical document up to such a degree that as late as the first century BC, students in school were required to memorize the Twelve Tables. And so this means that we actually have pieces of it because these people, these uh, students, when they grew up, they would quote it back in some of their written sources. And this is great for us because law codes make great historical sources. Because law codes relate to conditions, actual conditions, in the world in which they appear. And so the Twelve Tables then give us uh, a lot of information about various aspects of Roman life. So they talk to us about economic relationships. So the Twelve Tables, for example, talks about debting and debtors. And it says that unless they make a settlement, debtors shall be held in bounds for 60 days. And during that time, they shall brought, be brought before the praetor's court in the meeting place, this is the forum, on three successive market days, and the amount for which they are judged liable shall be announced, and on the third market day they shall either suffer capital punishment or be delivered up for sale abroad. Now the thing, uh, the headline in this that is particularly striking to us is Romans kill debtors. And that is something that the law says is possible, right? Debtors can be killed. But if we look at what the law is actually saying, it's requiring that there be a long process of negotiation through which debtors and creditors try to come to some kind of accommodation. So basically the first step is debtors should try to make a settlement with their creditors. That's the first thing, unless they make a settlement. So if they make a settlement, all of this is gone, right? If you're a debtor and you make a settlement with your creditor, none of the rest of this applies. But if you make a settlement with your creditor, uh, or if you can't make a settlement with your creditor, then you're held in bonds for 60 days. But still, this is a process of negotiation. You can't run away, you can't abscond, you can't sort of um, go somewhere else and not be liable for your debt. You are bound to that debt, but for 60 days, you now can still negotiate. And it's a public negotiation. And so a debtor will be brought forward into the forum three times. And they will, it will be announced to people, this is what this person owes. Now, this is not to shame the debtor. This is instead an invitation for some outsider to come in and possibly bail that debtor out. You know, to say, in essence, we will buy that loan. Um, we will repay the loan for the creditor and we will give the debtor more time. Um, the debtor's family, perhaps, could put together resources and pay off the loan and then the, the debtor will be released. Uh, but there's lots and lots of opportunities now for negotiation, public negotiation, involving people that aren't just the debtor and the creditor. But finally, on the third market day, um, at this point, you know, if you've gone through this negotiation and no process, no resolution can be reached, then they will either be killed or they will be sold, they will be sold as a slave abroad. Now, of course, if the person, if the debtor is killed, that ends the matter. The creditor does not actually get their money back. So no creditor is actually going to choose that. No creditor is going to actually want the person to be killed because you don't get your money back. It's just a vindictive thing to do to somebody, and you basically lose money on that activity. And so the sale, the sale of the person abroad as a slave is actually the solution that would have happened nearly all of the time. But again, Romans try very hard to create structures to avoid something like that happening. There is required mediation. Um, there is required public announcement so that somebody can prevent this outcome from happening. Um, this is still, we should acknowledge, a brutal way to handle debt. But the idea of killing a debtor is not the starting point. It's the end point. And it's an end point that Romans try very, very hard to get around. Um, and so what we see here is, again, a process of negotiation. At the end, if the negotiation fails, there is a horrible outcome. But that horrible outcome is by no means preordained if someone defaults on the loan. There's lots of ways to get to some kind of a solution that doesn't result in that. Um, 
Another group of texts concerns rural life. Uh, and what we see is uh, in this text um, on table eight, uh, we see an aspect that describes the struggles that you would have in a rural environment with fires, um, especially in a Mediterranean climate where fires are common uh, and quite possible. Uh, and so this says that if, if somebody has burned uh, someone's house or building or, or farm uh, produce, they'll be bound, scourged, and put to death by burning at the stake, but only if they have done this with malice aforethought. And so what this says is premeditation matters. So if there's an accidental fire, you don't get burned at the stake for causing an accidental fire. Accidental fires happen all the time in the Mediterranean climate, especially when houses are built out of wood and grain is stored um, in, you know, in ways that are particularly prone to possibly catching on fire. <clears throat> but if you're an arsonist, you know, if you go out and decide you're going to burn somebody's stuff down, then you do get this uh, penalty. Now, to us, this seems self-evident. But it's actually quite interesting that the Romans are very clear that intent matters. If you intend to create this damage, then you should be subject to a very serious penalty. But if you didn't intend to create this damage, then that penalty is not something that actually um, should be attached to you. And so there's two ways of defending yourself against a charge of arson that can result in your really horrible death. Um, the first is to say, I didn't do it. And of course, that works for all charges. If you didn't do it, you didn't do it. You're innocent, you're innocent. But you can also say, look, I, it was an accident. And if you can prove that this was an accident, you also can escape this terrible punishment. Um, now, also interesting is uh, these sorts of things that fall under the category of torts. I um, mean, here we see, you know, we've so far seen that Roman society is actually quite nuanced in the way that it applies laws. This is something where I think we maybe can see a little less nuance. Um, this looks not like a sophisticated society that's struggling with legal principles uh, that are on some level relatively advanced. This looks pretty primitive. So if a person is sung or composed a song against a person that was causing slander or insult, he shall be clubbed to death. If a person has maimed another's limb, let there be retaliation in kind unless he makes an agreement for settlement with him. So if we look at these two things, these look like pretty primitive. I mean, these really are eye for an eye kind of things. Um, if you've hurt somebody, then you get hurt in a similar way, uh, unless you make an agreement. So that's the one thing where you can see Roman society moving out of the very basic eye for an eye principle. Uh, it offers a inducement to come to some kind of monetary settlement for somebody with somebody that you have done harm to. Uh, and so, you know, if you poke out somebody's eye, you're going to lose your eye unless you make an agreement with them to pay them and compensate them for the loss of their eye. And if you do that, then you're not going to be maimed in a similar fashion. So again, Romans here are inducing settlement. They don't want to basically blind everybody in their society who has poked out somebody's eye. Um, what they want is you to be forced to make an agreement with them. But then you get to this other one. This idea of uh, slandering or insulting somebody in a, a song um, or even repeating a song that somebody else has composed that slanders someone. Clubbing to death is a pretty horrible way to die. It's not as bad as being burned alive, but it's a pretty horrible way to die. And here what we see is there isn't actually a negotiation process. Um, it may well be that someone will decide not to bring something to, to trial because they've negotiated uh, an aspect of a settlement, but this is something that doesn't have an off-ramp. Harming somebody's reputation in some ways is actually more serious than poking out their eye. Uh, and this, I think, reflects a kind of still primitive aspect of what Roman life is like. Um, honor still matters very greatly in Roman life in a fashion that suggests that once it's diminished, it's very hard, almost impossible to bring it back. And so it's a capital offense to attack somebody's honor in a way that it's not to attack, say, somebody's arm. Um, that, I think, is a quite interesting thing about Roman society. Now, this points to... 
Um, a final aspect in the 10th table that is also really important for us to understand because it allows us to understand a lot about how Romans interacted with each other. These are laws related to funerals, and there's a lot of them. Um, and so one of them is a dead man shall not be buried or burned within the city. Women must not tear their cheeks or hold a chorus of a lass on account of a funeral. When a man is dead, one must not gather his bones to make a second funeral. Anointing of the body by slaves is prohibited, as is every kind of drinking bout. And to make more than one funeral for a man should not occur, and a person should not add gold to the body. Now, what this reflects is a society that is very concerned about status. Because if you think about what a funeral conveys, on the one hand, it's a, a, an honoring of someone who is deceased. And that's, of course, quite obvious. And we do that in our society as well. But on the other hand, it's an ostentatious celebration of who that person was. A public funeral <clears throat> is a statement about why that person mattered but it's also a statement about why the, the descendants of that person who are still alive matter. And so if you hold an elaborate funeral for a recently deceased ancestor, what you are able to do is to say that this person mattered in a great way, but also I have the resources to honor that person in a significant way. This is in a sense the flip side of Table 8's description of um, slandering someone. If you slander somebody, you're diminishing their honor. You're diminishing their public profile. You're actually attacking them in a way that causes really serious damage to how they are seen by others in their community. The funeral does the opposite. It allows you to advertise your status in a community by emphasizing the things that your ancestors had done for that community. Um, and so a Roman funeral involves a procession usually, a Roman public funeral involves a procession usually of the person who's deceased, but also images and even some cases eventually like actors dressed up to represent the ancestors. Uh, and so a really elaborate funeral is in a sense a play demonstrating what a family has done for Rome over a long period of time. And the more impressive that play is, the more influential the person putting it on looks to be. And so a funeral is, in a way, a celebration about the past that also speaks to the present and the future. If you, for example, have lots and lots and lots of people who are paid to walk in a funeral procession and scream about how upset they are about the person's death, that conveys to the Roman public the influence of that individual. And so that's why women should not tear their cheeks or hold a chorus of a lass on a funeral procession or on account of a funeral, uh, because that's in a way stagecraft designed to make it clear that this person was really important, and also um, stagecraft designed to emphasize the importance of that family and the people who are still alive in that family in the Roman world. The same is true of putting on a large drinking bout, right? If you hold a massive uh, feast with lots of free alcohol at somebody's funeral, you are conveying something about your resources that might encourage people to think positively about the people who are still alive from that family and might destabilize Roman social relationships as people uh, shift from one aristocratic patron or one wealthy patron to another. And the same is true of things like adding gold to a funeral or having multiple funerals or even um, building a giant tomb to somebody in the city limits. Now, there are religious prescriptions and religious reasons why Romans don't like having dead bodies within the city limits. It's seen as a, a thing that um, needs to be purified. It's not a, a way that maintains the, sac the sacred purity of the city. But it's also something where, as we will see later in the course, if you build a giant tomb for yourself within the city limits, you are making a statement about how important you are because most people can't do that. And so these laws about funerals are a flip side of these laws about insults and about slanders. Uh, and this tells us something very important about the nature of 5th century Rome. This is still an extremely hierarchical society, a society made up of elite patrons, many of whom are patricians, but not all of whom are patricians, and clients, the people who are not members of this elite who rely on these patrons to make them um, look good and to protect their interests. And patrons competed with each other to get clients. Patrons competed with each other to develop followings. 
And as we're in the middle of the fifth century, we have to also imagine that wealthy plebeian patrons are competing with aristocratic patrician patrons for clients. And so these laws that you see in the 12 tables are designed to provide kind of restrictions and rules for that competition. Uh, one thing you can't do is sing songs about a rival to try to diminish them and potentially take away their influence or even take away some of their clients. You also cannot advertise in a, pop in a, in a positive way your own attributes so that you can perhaps attract clients from other patrons. What this is doing is regulating that social hierarchy and preventing things and actions that destabilize that social hierarchy by moving patrons and clients and asserting the prominence of some patrons um, as they rise and forcing other patrons to be diminished in the public eye as those people become more important. And so this is what's ultimately driving many aspects of the 12 tables. It's also, of course, why it's important to understand the decemvirate as a kind of constitutional experiment that's trying to stabilize dynamics in the Roman state. Um, the 12 tables laws remain in place even after the decemvirate falls. And so they are actually performing a very useful function in managing the dynamics of that ever-shifting Roman political and social hierarchy.